So we're going to look at uh, patterns of inheritance here in this chapter, and you can see that we have a picture of children here in the um, the title slide. And you can see that all these children do look uh, different, and so this uh, is just to highlight uh, genetic variation that we see within populations. But if you were to look at any one of these uh, children and uh, then look at their parents, uh, you would see that there are some similarities. They do not look like uh, their parents exactly, but look quite similar because they inherited traits from their parents. Uh, however, they inherited a, a recombination of those traits. So genetic recombinations is uh, going to be a very important theme in, in populations and how uh, one gener uh, generation and the variability there is passed on to the next one. And um, how populations evolve over time. But we're going to look at the basics of inheritance uh, here, and we're going to start with a little bit of history uh, in the first section. So here, uh, the mystery of heredity uh, section here, your learning outcomes are going to be to describe and explain uh, inheritance prior to Gregor Mendel, who has uh, discovered uh, some of these patterns. Uh, and then your second objective is to explain the advantage of Mendel's uh, experimental system. Uh, and really is just be more familiar with uh, uh, his strategy for studying uh, inheritance. And he did so in um, uh, plant, uh, pea plants, uh, the peas that you eat. Uh, so before the 20th century, so you're talking about um, uh, the 1800s and so on, uh, and then before getting into the 1900s. Uh, so before the, the 1900s started, uh, two concepts were the basis uh, for the idea of heredity and basically how do offspring uh, get their traits. Uh, and so one key feature is that heredity occurs within species. So uh, basically uh, one generation from a species passes on to their offspring uh, uh, in the next generation. And that parents are trans uh, that traits are transmitted directly from parent to offspring. So these ideas uh, were something that was accepted. Uh, but it was thought that traits were born through a fluid uh, material, and uh, then they blended together in the offspring. Okay? So uh, back then, they didn't know anything about chromosomes. They didn't know anything about DNA. They didn't know uh, there's just something that the parents were giving that was fluid and then translated into the traits you saw in the next generation in, in the offspring from the parents. But there's a paradox to that second bullet there on blending and uh, fluid blending of traits, a paradox. Uh, and if this is the case, then why, if we have this continued blending generation after generation, uh, why at some point do we not get the entire population to look the same if this blending is occurring? After, if, it's, if it's occurring and, and traits are blending, then eventually you're just going to get a mix. It's like if you... Uh, started melting colors, and you made them fluid, and then you start mixing, you're not going to get purple anymore, you're not going to get uh, uh, any of the other colors in the box. Uh, you're just going to get one color, right? So that's the paradox here of what's going on. So some early work, if you look in uh, at 1760, uh, a guy named Joseph uh, Kohlruder uh, cross tobacco strains or different types of, of tobacco plants and produced hybrids. And what he saw was that uh, the hybrids differed from both parents. So you have uh, traits of one type of plant, tobacco plant, another one, you put them together and you cross them. And then those two plants, the next generation, the seed to grow up, and you look at them and you see that they look different from the parents, right? And then so. Uh, also, additional variation in the second generation of offspring. Uh, so this uh, contradicts that uh, transmission. So uh, it contradicts the sort of that blending idea uh, where they don't look like the parents at all. Uh, and then T.A. Knight in 1823 crossed two varieties of the garden pea, which is what Gregor Mendel, we're going to see, works with a little bit, uh, about 30 years after this. Uh, the scientific name is Pisum uh, uh, sativa, and this is important because uh, I've been looking at uh, the way scientific names are written. Just important to remind you that when you write scientific names, but you only capitalize the genus. You do not capitalize the second name, which 
is called the specific epithet, and the species name is the two. It's a binomial, and if you're handwriting it, you underline them, right? If you're able to type it, then you write it in italics. So you see the italicized, and they only capitalize the genus, well, not the species, just a reminder there on how you write scientific names properly. Uh, so uh, anyway, T.A. Knight in 1823 looked at uh, the pea, garden pea, uh, Pisum sativa, and um, he crossed two true breeding strains. What does that mean by true breeding strains? This means that he, let's say you have some plants with you and every generation when you, you pollinate and then they produce more seed pods and then the peas that you eat are seeds, you plant them and then they grow and every generation the traits in all of the all of the of the offspring continue to look exactly the same. So they would be considered pure breeding or true strain, a uh, true breeding strain. So he looked at two that differed in some way. Some trait uh, could be flower color or something, and then uh, same one might have one flower color and the other one another one, and then cross them. And he found that the uh, that first generation after uh, breeding the two strains, the first group of offspring, they only resembled one parent. Okay, so uh, again, what, we see something. What happened to the other trait, the the other color or whatever? Uh, did it disappear or what? Uh, and then that totally does not support the idea of blending because if it was blending, then it should look like both parents, right? Uh, and then he got the offspring after that first breeding uh, trial. And then the offspring grew up and they only looked like one parent. Then got those and then bred those, that next generation. So then the generation after that, so called here the second generation, so this might be the parental generation, and then this is the first generation of offspring, and then the next generation after that. So three generations here, the parental, and then uh, the first offspring, and then breeding those offspring to get the second generation, found that we were able to see both traits again. So they sort of, one of the traits disappeared here during that uh, first, where you breed the two, two breeding ones. And so again, there's no blending, and one of them seemed to disappear in a generation, then came back again. So along comes Gregor Mendel. Uh, and he was uh, a monk in a monastery, and uh, he, is, he had some science uh, background, uh, and mathematical background, uh, and I think there was a chemist and a physicist that he studied under that were influenced, the physicist had an influence on uh, in, uh, describing and using mathematics to describe uh, natural phenomena. Uh, and so um, while he was in the monastery, the the monks there were growing peas, so there was peas there, and they're pretty easy to study. So Gregor Mendel was looking at peas, and one reason he looked at them is because uh, the, the prior studies, like uh, the one we just saw earlier with Knight, uh, that the peas can produce hybrids, right? So that was easy, and then uh, there was many varieties of peas, different colors, different sizes, and other traits that we're going to look at, uh, and that uh, the peas are relatively easy to grow. Uh, so um, I, I often have my students do uh, these experiments uh, for growing seeds in uh, bean uh, bean family, which are the peas. The peas are in the bean family. Those uh, the seeds that are in there are, are easy to grow, uh, so they're pretty easy to grow. And uh, the flower structure uh, for the peas, they can self fertilize uh, because they have both male and female parts. So it's uh, referred to as a complete flower. Uh, and they're easy to cross fertilize. So, see, when you cross fertilize, it's like cross breeding them, and you can get pollen from one plant and then easily pollinate the flower on another plant. So, that would be cross fertilization. So, these things made peas ideal for study. Plus, they don't run away from you, they're, they're in the garden. <laughs> right? So, here was Mendel's uh, experimental method three basic stages. One, was to make sure you had true breeding strains. Like I was mentioning earlier, that every generation they give you the exact same traits. And in this case, very simple case of a trait of flower color, okay? Uh, and, or the character flower color. So let's call it the characteristic is the flower color. There is a gene for flower color, and then there's different versions of that uh, flower color, we'll call those traits. So the, there's the purple trait or the white trait. And, uh, uh, if it's the gene itself, sometimes they refer to those different versions of the gene as an allele. So there's an allele for purple flower and an allele for white flower. So let's say the Mendel has pure true breeding purple flower peas and then in a separate part of the garden, true breeding white. So he did that and he also did this for other characters. So there's some terminology here. A character would be like flower color. 
uh, and characters are determined by genes, right? Uh, and then you have trait, all right? And so a trait, so a character is a type of, uh, is, uh, is what you're looking at is there's a gene or more than one gene behind it, a gene or genes. Uh, and then the trait is the uh, specific expression of that gene. And so when it, it comes to that, it's, uh, there's a different expression of that gene. It's because there's different versions of a gene because of mutations that occur. And we refer to those as alleles. Okay? Uh, and so sometimes these terms get uh, used interchangeably and so on. But uh, keep in mind uh, that we are looking at true breeding for some a trait that we're looking at, right? And we're going to look and see what other traits he studied. The other thing was, uh, so he had some true breeding ones, and then in his experimental design, he cross-fertilized these true breeding ones. Okay? Uh, and then he also performed uh, reciprocal crosses. So uh, what's meant by a reciprocal cross? Well, if I have purple and white flowers uh, in one kind of cross uh, experiment, I take pollen from the purple flower and then use it to pollinate the white flower. That's one way of doing it. The other way, the reciprocal would be instead to take the, the pollen from the white flower and then use it to pollinate the purple flower. That would be a reciprocal cross. Okay? And the idea here is because the, the flowers have uh, pollen and they also have the ovules uh, that contain the egg that get uh, uh, fertilized by the, the sperm and the pollen, uh, you want to remove the, the anthers the anthers are the structures where the pollen is produced. You want to remove them before they mature so they don't release pollen. In other words, we don't want this pollen to land on the location uh, where it can fertilize its own uh, um, um, eggs within those ovules in there. So these little structures in there, those are where the eggs are located. You don't want to do that, so you cut them out. So you can see there's scissors right there cutting them out, so he's removed them. Uh, this way we don't self-pollinate. And then you get a like a paintbrush, uh, a fine brush, and you're going to remove pollen from a mature flower, a white flower. And then you go and you brush it there on the stigma, the part where the pollen lands. Okay, so now you've pollinated, and this uh, flower now is going to turn into the fruit, and the fruit is the seed pod. Okay, these ovules then mature into seeds, the peas that we eat. Each one of those we can plant and let them grow, and then observe what their flowers look like. Okay, so. Uh, that's the basic idea. So you're going to cross, do the cross fertilization, and then what you're going to end up getting is hybrids. And you're going to have to now go and take those seeds, and if you're going to look at flower color, you're going to have to plant them, the the, the progeny, uh, the offspring, and you're going to let them grow, and then you have to let them mature to, to develop flowers, right? And so what you want to do is, well, see what they get, because you're looking at the trait for flower color, right? So uh, that's the thing now. So you're going to allow those hybrids to grow. Uh, Count what you get, how many to look a certain way. Uh, and then uh, you're going to also take these guys here, and then you're going to allow them to self-fertilize. So we're going to take these guys and then let them pollinate themselves, this generation. So we're going we're gonna to let that generation now produce their next, the, the, the third generation after that. Right. So we start with the parental, the true breeding. Uh, we'll call these P. And then we cross fertilize, and we get that next generation, which we're going to refer to as F1, which uh, stands for the son's uh, first filial generation. And then take the F1, and then cross those, and then see what we get after that. That's the basic idea there. So in this uh, section, we're going to use Gregor Mendel's results uh, from what's called mono hybrid crosses, uh, and a concept that comes out of that called the principle of segregation. Okay. And so your learning outcomes here to evaluate the outcome of a monohybrid cross and then explain at Mendel's principle of segregation and then compare the segregation of alleles with the behavior of homologs during meiosis. Back when Mendel was doing this, they didn't know about chromosomes and certainly didn't know about meiosis, which we just uh, studied in the prior chapter. Uh, and I want to be clear here that when we talk about a monohybrid cross, we're talking about looking at one trait, and both individuals need to be hybrids. So when we were talking about, let's say, Gregor Mendel's uh, experiment, uh, let's say we have pure breeding purple, and we're going to cross with pure, pure breeding white flowers. Okay, This is the parental generation. So when we cross these, the next generation 
is the F1, those would be the hybrids. Okay, so whatever those hybrids look like, those would be the hybrids. Okay, they're hybrids and they've inherited something from both parents. This is parent one and parent two. When we talk about a mono hybrid cross and we're only looking at one trait, it's mono. And when you're crossing them, both uh, individuals that you're crossing the pollen with have to be hybrids. In other words, they have to be part of uh, the known hybrids. The F1s are known hybrids because those are the offspring from the two pure breeding uh, groups, the purple group and the white group. Okay, so that's what's meant by monohybrid. Okay, so uh, well, Mendel's uh, strategy, he always looked at two variations for a single trait. Okay. And he had seven varieties to look at, or not seven varieties, but seven characters, okay? And each of those characters had two traits. So here they're using trait and character interchangeably, but what were the characters? The characters are what you're looking at, okay? And then the trait is that version of that character, right? So when you talk about the character flower color, purple or white, okay? So here were the characters that he looked at. So we might say these are the characters, and for each character, there was two variations or two possible uh, traits, right? So one is flower color. Well, there's a picture here of them. So you got flower color. Uh, then you have position of the flower. That's the next one there. Uh, so purple or white uh, are the two variations. And then whether you're axial, which is going to be in the middle between the stem and the branch or at the end, terminal. And then seed color yellow or green, and then the shape. You're either round or you're wrinkled. And then a pod shape. You're either inflated or constricted. And then pod color, green or yellow. And then the stem length. You're either going to be tall or dwarf plant. Okay, so those were the seven uh, uh, characters it looked at, and each one had two variants. Okay, so we're going to look at what's called the F1 generation, right? So when you're looking at uh, your parentals, their true breeding. Purple is uh, flowered, uh, generation of generation giving nothing but purple flowers, and the same for the white flowers. We're going to call those, when we cross them, that's going to be called the parental generation. So that's just modeled here. You're going to take purple true breeding flowers, and you're going to take white true breeding flowers, and you're going to pollinate, cross pollinate, cross to cross fertilize, and you get your F1 generations, which are the hybrids. Okay, so. Uh, First filial, or F1, the term filial is Latin and means sons, which is basically reference to the offspring, right? Okay, so uh, the parental generation basically gives rise to uh, these uh, F1 generation. When he did this with the purple flower, he found that all he got was 100% of them after he grew them from seed, he, all he got was purple flowers in that F1 generation. So something happened to the white flowers. Where did they go? And if we follow a logic that says that this generation, each individual had to inherit the, the trait from each parent, okay? So you're getting two copies of whatever it is. We don't know what it is because they don't know about genes back then. You had to have gotten something from one parent and something from another, and we might assume that what you got was equal parts from each one. It seems that somehow the white one vanished. It went away, okay? The trait that did show in the F1 generation is going to be referred to as the dominant trait. And the one that seems to be hiding here in the F1 generation, it went somewhere. We don't know. Did it disappear for good? He didn't know. Is it recessive? Okay. It's not until you take this F1 generation and then breed those that you, uh, you're going to start to see whites again. Right. Uh, so by convention, we're going to assign the dominant trait to keep track of these a capital letter. Now that we've done the first ex breeding experiment and we've gone from parental to F1, we're going to give a capital P to purple because we know it's the dominant trait. And for the recessive one, we're going to give a lowercase p. Okay. So following this logic, each parent had to have given the offspring a, a copy of each. So this parent must have only had little peas to give, and this one must have only had big peas, whatever it was, okay? A heritable factor, he might have called it. And that means that these guys, if you have one copy from each parent, then the purple ones had one copy of each. And it seems that the uh, dominant uh, trait 
was uh, is the capital P, the the, char the trait that you're getting from the purple parent. The little p is still there. You got it from the white flower, but it's just not dominating. It's not showing in that generation. Okay. Now, if the F1 generation got one copy from each parent, then the parental generation had its own parents prior to that. And that must mean that the purple flowers had both copies. So purebred, two capital P's, and your uh, white flowers had two little P's. There's going to be a term used for these heritable factors that Mendel came up with, even though they didn't know about genes, didn't know about DNA, didn't know about chromosomes, he called these alleles, okay? So it seems that the purple flower parental generation had two dominant alleles and the white flower had two recessive alleles. The F1 generation has one of each allele and it's a hybrid and they all look purple, okay? Now, taking the F1 generation and crossing those to give you the F2 generation. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take two purple F1s and we're going to cross those. And remember, these guys now are hybrids. They have one capital allele dominant and one lowercase recessive allele each. And so now he crossed those and in the F2 generation, he went and he counted and he is dealing with large numbers of seeds. And what he gets is 705 plants that had purple flowers and 224 plants that had uh, uh, white flowers. And so if we look at that ratio, 705 to 224, and we wanted to reduce it to the least possible ratio, we're going to divide both by the smaller number, uh, 224 and 224. And when you do that, uh, the ratio becomes about 3 to 1. So he found that he got about a 3 to 1 ratio. Okay. He also found this for all those other traits. So he did the same thing with all those other, with the six other traits. Uh, position of the flower, color of the seed, shape of the pod, height of the plant. In every case, he got about a 3 to 1. So he's starting to think now uh, about the assumption that each parent is giving one copy of that heritable factor didn't call them genes yet, didn't know about chromosomes and so on. He's thinking this and he's thinking about his mathematics background that he got from his phys physics education and so on. He's saying there must be a way to model this with mathematics. And so, uh, again, time and time again, here the actual ratio 705 to 224 really gives us about 3.15, which rounds to about 3 to 1. When you're looking at the seeds, remember the pods uh, of the next uh, of that uh, F2 generation. There's, they went parental, then F1, and then the hybrid, the monohybrid cross is taking the F1s and crossing them. That's your monohybrid cross, uh, and he gets uh, 6,022 yellow and 2,001 green, and that ratio turns out to a 3.01 to 1, which is 3 to 1. Uh, and then the same for the uh, the round and the wrinkled, about three to one. And then the, the color of the pods, 2.8, which rounds to about three. Uh, and then the C, the pot shape, again, about three to one. The position of the flower, again, about three to one. And the taller short, about three to one. Now, the one that's showing up as uh, the three in the ratio three to one uh, and if we go back and we follow what was happening here, the one that shows up as a ratio of 3 to 1, the 1 being a 3, so it's really, a, when we talk about it, it's 3 plus 1 is 4, so it's really 3 out of every 4 plants really are showing that dominant trait that we saw uh, in, the F, uh, one, in the F1 generation. And 1 out of every 4, right, because all of this is 4, but 1 out of every 4 here is showing uh, the recessive trait. Okay, so when you think about it, you go and you look at these results, you can tell which one is the dominant. In this case, purple flowers is dominant. You only figure this out when you do the experiment. You don't know ahead of time. We figure this out later. Yellow seems to be the dominant color of the peas. It's just weird because we, we're used to eating green peas, right? But when you have the two varieties, the yellow seems to be dominant. The texture, the round is dominant. Uh, and you don't have to memorize it, just pointing out. You can go through and tell what's the dominant. The tall plant is the dominant, for example. So you can go back and look which one's the dominant one, the one that shows 
uh, uh, three out of every four plants uh, in that you get in the F2 generation after the monohybrid cross. So going back and following here, where, where does the monohybrid cross occurs? It occurs by taking the F1 generations and crossing those. This is your monohybrid cross, okay? And I want to point this out here because sometimes you'll run across uh, worksheets that are created by people and they go and they take a, a cross, say like if we were to take the cross for this parental generation, this would be uh, like this. And this is a one trait cross, but it is not a hybrid cross. In order to be a hybrid cross, you have to be heterozygote for both individuals that you're crossing. This is a monohybrid cross. This is not a monohybrid cross. It's a one trait cross. So be careful with that and just the, the misuse of the term monohybrid cross. Okay. You'll see cases where they look at this and they say this is a monohybrid cross. It's not. There's only one hybrid there. The other one is not. So this is just a one trait cross. So whenever I ask you a question and it uses the word monohybrid, I don't have to tell you the, the letters. You know what they're going to be. Let's just use letter A. That means one capital letter, one little letter, and you know how to do it from there. So keep that in mind. This is an important side note to make. Monohybrid is very specific. It means you're, hetero, you're gonna have uh, one big letter and one little letter for each individual that's being crossed, okay? If it's not that, then it's just a one trait cross. So keep that in mind, very important. So what did Mendel actually find out? It turns out that he went a step further and went to a third filial generation after that, right? And so when you look at uh, what you see, okay, the purple flower, the white flower, that's what it looks like, okay? We're going to see a term here that's going to be brought up that's going to be called the phenotype, okay? When you look at the phenotype, the phenotype is what it looks like. When we look at the F2 uh, generation, we got three dominant for every one recessive. So remember, we started off with our true breeding, Purple and white both are uh, have the same um, allele, right? This two dominant, two recessive. This one is hybrid. And then, and and you don't know really, but he doesn't know about genes. He doesn't know about DNA, but he knows they must be getting something. The, the offspring, the F1 offspring, must be getting one of each from the parent, some heritable factor. That's it. He's just the factor you're getting from them. And so he's using logic here to figure this out. Okay. And so he's going on and he comes to the F2 generation here. And so all he can see is flower color. He doesn't know what each flower is carrying. He doesn't know the, the purple, what they're carrying. But he does know that based on some logic here, that the white flowers must be little peas only. But for the purple, because of what we saw in the F1 generation, they can be big P, little P, or they can be big P, big P. So he doesn't really know what these guys are actually carrying they got from the parent, right? So the point here is that if we just look at phenotype, what they look like, then it's a three to one ratio. But he actually found that it's really a one to two to one ratio by taking this experiment one generation further. So what he did was he went ahead and took individual plants. I'm just gonna take the end. Remember, this is three out of every four are purple, right? So that could mean if you have a thousand plants, okay? That mean roughly about 750 of these plants uh, are going to be purple, right? It's three out of every four. Okay, so when you took those flowers, probably random sample from there, took those plants, and then self-fertilized. That means you're going to take the pile in and you're going to put it on your own flower to pollinate your own flower. And see what you get. Okay. And what he got was uh, he got one out of every four plants in the F3 generation here. So this is the F3. So it says there it's real small, F3. He found that uh, when he self pollinated, that, that one out of every four plants, all they gave was purple. Uh, the, the seeds that they developed, they went and they grew, and all they gave was purple. And then he found that two out of every four produced white flowers again. Okay. 
So let's say we just took an individual plant and we self-fertilized it and we get that three to one ratio. That must mean that this one was heterozygote, must mean, because you're getting the same three to one ratio you got back in the F2 generation. So he got that case in two out of every four. Okay. And then when he was doing the self-pollinating with the white flowers, all he got was white flowers. So they must have been true breeding to begin with. So he uncovered just by looking a generation further, going one more generation, he uncovered that really what they were carrying. He's able to figure it out just by looking at the flower color. He's able to figure out that the real ratio is a, a one to two to one and a, a one true breeding dominant. Okay, one out of every four of the F1 generation. So it's real simplified here. One out of every four, when you self-pollinated, only gave purple flowers. That's all you got. And then two out of every four that he self-pollinated to get the next generation. Two out of every four seem to be not true, non-true breeding. Okay, but they expressed uh, the dominant trait. Okay, because they're expressing the dominant, those in the middle. And how do we know this? They're not true breeding because when you self-pollinate, you get some white flowers back. And then he found that one out of uh, every one of those, one out of every four, so this was this is two out of four, this is one out of four, one out of every four were true breeding recessive. In other words, he got those white ones and he self-pollinated them and all they gave was white flowers, right? So really, he is with using a bit of logic and determining that you have true breeding. They must have two copies of that in that heritable factor, doesn't know about genes, doesn't know about DNA, doesn't know about chromosomes. And uh, figuring this out really with just counting flowers and using logic and mathematics to figure this out. This is amazing because they don't know about DNA. They don't know about genes yet. Okay. So what are some conclusions here? Uh, there was no intermediate traits. And what does that mean? No blending. Remember uh, that... Prior to the 1900s, people theorized that traits must be blended, right? In other words, that whatever the parents are giving to their offspring, those heritable factors, which we now call genes, and we now know where those genes are located, they're on DNA, that they're discrete. There is no blending. In other words, they remain separate from each other. Okay. You take the case of the purple flower, that heritable factor we now know as a gene is actually a separate entity all on its own, and so is the white uh, heritable factor. We now call them genes in their segments of DNA on a chromosome. Okay, Didn't know those, those things yet. Now, for each pair of traits, one is dominant and the other is recessive, uh, and pairs of alternative traits uh, that examine segregated, that means they were separated, uh, among the progeny of a particular cross. So, uh, in other words, we are, uh, if your individuals that you're breeding, they have two copies, right? And this is your F1 generation. You have one common, uh, one dominant. That's what this is saying here. Uh, you have one dominant, one recessive, and then you're crossing with another individual plant, one dominant recessive, and they segregate in the next generation. That means that they're going to be split apart and one can be found uh, one is given to one uh, in uh, the next generation and the other parent can also give one of the dominant to the next generation. The point is that the the generation that's producing the, the, the offspring is going to give either one or the other. So you segregate, you're separating these uh, heritable factors and then you're giving your offspring one or the other. Okay, that's the idea. Uh, a little bit challenging to describe that, but that's the basic idea. Same thing here for the other parent. Both parents are giving either one or the other. And which one they give, we're going to find, uh, seems to be in a random fashion. Okay. Uh, and so this is just what's being seen and what the conclusions can be drawn, just using a bit of mathematics and those observations. Um, so these alternative traits that we're seeing are going to be expressed in that F2 generation. And we're going to see a three out of every four dominant to one out of every four recessive. And that's what you get when you're going to be crossing you're uh, doing a monohybrid cross. Anytime you do a monohybrid cross, which is like what you got in an F1 generation, where you get the two parentals that are pure breeding, what you're going to end up getting is you're going to get in three out of every four that are dominant, purple, and you're going to get one out of every four that are going to be the recessive white. Uh, and that's what you get. So uh, from here, a model... Um,
can be derived from uh, these observations, careful records, and applications of a little bit of mathematics. Uh, the five element model here. These are the five main things that are assumptions based on the study and uh, the analysis of the data. First of all, parents are going to transmit these discrete, and I call them heritable factors. Today we now know these are called genes, which are segments of DNA. They didn't know about those again. Uh, mentioning that again, they don't know about DNA, they don't know about chromosomes, they don't know about any of that. Now, uh, each individual offspring is going to receive one copy we're going to refer to those as genes, but back then he called them heritable factors from each parent. Okay, So these factors, each individual offspring gets one from each parent. That's an assumption, right? Okay, it's Verified data, understanding the meiosis and so on. Uh, not all copies of the gene are going to be identical. Here is where the term allele comes from. Okay, and What is an allele? An allele is an alternative form of that heritable factor, which we now call genes. If you have two of the same heritable factors... We're going to call that a homozygous. Okay. And if you have two different alleles, we're going to call you heterozygous. Okay. So this would be homozygous if you're an offspring and inherited that. And two little p's would be homozygous. But if you have one of each, then you're heterozygous. Okay. So that's how you apply those terms. Uh, these alleles, those genes are going to be discrete. There's no blending. Okay. It's because you either get purple or white. You don't get a light-colored purple when you blend. They don't blend. Now, the dominant allele, when it, you, if you have both of these, if you're heterozygote, the dominant is expressed, and the other one, you're carrying a white allele, but it's not showing. It's like it's like recessed. It's not being shown. A recess would be like a hiding place, right? You go, you go hiding in some hiding place. So we're going to refer to that as a recessive allele. It's going to be hidden because the dominant allele is going to be the one that's shown or expressed. Okay. Now, we I brought up the term phenotype earlier. Okay. The phenotype is what you get. You're either purple or you're white. You're tall or you're short. You're yellow P or you're a, a green P a C. Uh, the genotype is what you're carrying genetically. What is the set of alleles? Okay. So. This would be a genotype, for example, homozygous dominant. This would be a genotype, homozygous recessive. Or you have the heterozygote genotype. So the genotype is the set of genes, the letters, right? In practice for us, when we solve genetic problems, the letters, but there are two copies of the, of the gene, right? And the phenotype is what's expressed. What do you see? What does it look like? Okay. So... Um, this brings up the principle of segregation. Okay, so uh, two alleles for a gene are going to segregate, uh, and this is going to happen during gamete formation. Uh, and then they're going to rejoin at random, and you're going to get one from each parent during fertilization. So the fertilization is at random. So if we were to look again back at uh, uh, the heterozygote for flower color, an offspring can need from the first parent can either inherit the dominant allele or the recessive allele, and the other parent is either going to give the dominant allele or the recessive allele. Uh, and that's the point. When the gametes are made, this is going to be a random process which two of the possible types join. You can either get a big P from one parent and another one, so this is one possibility. You can get a big P from the first parent and a little P from the second one. Another possibility would be to get the small uh, allele or the recessive allele from the first parent and a large allele uh, or dominant allele from the second parent, or you can get both recesses, one from each parent. So these are the possibilities and it's purely random. Now notice, all things being equal, one out of four is uh, homozygous dominant, one out of the four possibilities homozygous recessive, and two out of the four in different ways, you get the same thing. You're going to get heterozygote, and both of those are going to show purple flowers. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, today we now know about chromosomes. We know about DNA, and we know that DNA has is where the genetic information is stored, and they're on the chromosomes. We now know the, how the, the chromosomes behave during meiosis. Each chromosome, remember, you get one pair from each parent. The genes are on there, okay? And you remember the chromosomes line up on the metaphase plate during meiosis one. They line up in pairs, and then they get separated 
uh, after the first division. So you're actually separating the alleles during that meiotic division, during meiosis. So the physical basis, knowing that DNA is on the gene, uh, the genes are on DNA and the DNA is in those chromosomes. We now know that this uh, principle of segregating the alleles, okay, we're separating the alleles is really due to the separation of or the segregation of chromosomes. We understand the mechanism now. That was not known in Mendel's time. That makes this amazing. That's this last point being highlighted there. So we can actually use Punnett squares to do this analysis. Uh, of a, a monohybrid cross. Okay, so uh, if we look at the F1 generation, we can use a Punnett square to predict the probability of what you should get. Now, you're not going to get perfect numbers. We saw with Mendel's numbers, even bit large numbers, it was roughly three to one, and that's due to just a random chance, right? You can flip a quarter 10 times and get heads each time, but eventually, if you keep flipping that coin long enough, the law of large numbers, you're going to eventually start getting half heads, half tails, right? So uh, what we would do then, if you're going to do a monohybrid cross, this is way you set up a Punnett square, you're going to separate each allele, and you're going to put one parent on top of the square. We're going to make four boxes, one for each possible um, allele that's going to be given or gamete, the gametes carrying these chromosomes with these alleles. So the first parent can either give a capital P or produce a gamete, a sperm or an egg with a lower, uh, with a recessive one because that's what the, that parent has to give. The next parent, same thing, and you put them on the side. Okay. Now, uh, during fertilization, let's say this is a sperm and this is an egg, it is possible that this dominant allele, uh, a sperm that's carrying the dominant allele, fertilizes this egg, because remember you only have one chromosome, one copy, and when they combine during fertilization, you're going to get homozygous dominant. It's possible that instead the first parent gives you the recessive and the second one gives you the dominant, and I'm going to recommend that you can put them in the order that you that's given there. Uh, but I'm going to recommend when you're doing Punnett square analysis, always put the capital letter first, uh, even though this first parent is giving the lowercase one. This way you can see uh, the similarities uh, easier. Uh, and in this lowercase square, you're going to get the uh, dominant and the recessive. And in the last box, you're going to get uh, homozygous recessive. So what do you get here? Phenotypically, you're going to get three purples, right? Three out of every four are going to be purple. So we might write three out of four, right? So we might three out of four purple, and you're going to get one out of four white. This is the phenotypic uh, results, what we predict. Okay. Not, don't get the perfect numbers, but you're going to, you would predict that you would get that if all things are random. And the ratio, we would say, is three purple, phenotypic ratio to uh, one white. Okay. So this is one a ratio to remember. Anytime you're doing a dihybrid cross, I'm, not, I'm sorry, not dihybrid, monohybrid cross, you always get a three to one ratio, dominant to recessive in the next generation, okay? Uh, that's something to remember. But what is the, so the phenotypic ratio, something to memorize. I rarely say memorize, but it's something to know it's handy because it'll help you answer questions quickly. Is gonna be three, uh, always gonna be three dominant, in this case, purple, to one uh, recessive. And that means three out of every four dominant. Uh, so when we're talking about results of a uh, monohybrid cross, the phenotypic ratio is going to be three to one, okay, dominant to recessive. What about the genotypic ratio? I'm going to generalize here using the capital letter A, okay? You're going to get one homozygous dominant to two heterozygotes to one homozygous recessive. Okay, and I like to use the letter A because you can easily distinguish between the capital and the lowercase. Okay, so um, uh, keep in mind the use of these terms here. 
Uh, you're going to get uh, homozygous recessives. You're going to get homozygous dominant, one out of every four. And then you're going to get two out of every four are going to be heterozygotes. So this just shows that... Uh, um, This is the parental generation right here. Okay, so this is the pure breeding white and pure breeding purple. So this is the pre-P generation, uh, and this is what you get with uh, in the F1 generation. And the results are in the squares. Uh, so this is pure breeding parent, pure breeding parent, uh, and when they uh, cross here, uh, you you get these guys are the F1 generation. You get these and you cross them. Okay, so each one is heterozygous. So that's a capital letter lowercase capital letter lowercase, you get that three to four ratio. So the prior slide didn't show the parental generation, but this would be the parental cross with the true pure breeding ones. And then here you get, uh, you're gonna take your, sorry, uh, you're gonna take, this is, these guys right here are your F1 generation. You're gonna take those and you're gonna put the F1s and you're gonna cross those. And this right here in the box, this is the prediction for the F2 generation. Okay. So the Punnett square is useful for making predictions about what you should get when you do uh, any kind of one trait crosses, whether you're doing two pure breeding uh, strains like you're on the top there, uh, whether you're doing, uh, say, a homozygote and you're going to cross it with a heterozygote. That's a one trait cross. It's not, a, it's not like a pure breeding cross like we did here. It's not a F1 cross. You're getting two hybrids. It's just a one trait cross. You can use Punnett squares to predict what you should get, uh, ratios, uh, phenotypic and genotypic ratios, and those are common genetic problems. So be able to use a Punnett square to solve these types of problems. So in fact, you can predict what you would get here. This would just be a one trait cross right there. You can do your Punnett square. And I'm just going to go ahead and predict that they're all going to look uh, purple because this parent is always going to give a capital letter. Okay. However, you're going to get one half homozygous, and uh, the genotypic ratio is going to be different. Phenotypically, they're all going to look purple, but you're going to get half are homozygous dominant, and the other half are heterozygous, and they're all going to look purple, but you can give me those ratios. Okay. So, um, human traits are um, going to be controlled by many, not all human traits, some human traits uh, are going to be controlled by more than one gene, like your height. That's more than one gene. If it was just one gene, then we would just be tall and short people and nothing in between. But many traits are going to be controlled by a single gene, uh, and they do follow a simple dominant recessive type of pattern that we saw in um, um, uh, Mendel's experiments with, with peace. Uh, and the thing is, many of these, uh, in many of these instances, these are related to genetic disorders. So you can actually use uh, an analysis called pedigree analysis uh, to try to make predictions um, from looking at your family history. So pedigree is looking at your family history. We can't do breeding experiments with humans. Number one, it's unethical. Number two, the generation time is like a long time. It's not like P is like uh, a very, very short generation time here, right? So what you do is you go back and you look at your family history and look and see which of your ancestors, parents, grandparent generation, the generation before that, you can go back and look who on there shows that trait. And then you start following this, and then you can actually go and figure out what genotypes are uh, from your relatives. And then you can even figure out if you know it from there, uh, what are the chances of you having uh, children that might uh, have that trait. And so this is very useful when there's genetic disorders. This is also true for non-genetic disorder traits, but oftentimes we discuss this in terms of genetic disorders. One of them uh, uh, is a disorder that's a dominant disorder caused by a dominant mutation that causes a juvenile glaucoma. Okay. And so uh, this is a disease that causes a degeneration of the optic nerve and blindness eventually. Um, and you're going to know it's dominant if you see it in every generation in your family tree. So uh, this is what a pedigree would look like and uh, for a dominant pedigree, a trait that's uh, transmitted that's dominant. Uh, and that means if it's dominant, first of all, if it's dominant, that means you have to at least have one dominant allele. 
The other one can be either dominant or recessive. So whenever I just put a blank here, that means it can be either capital A or little a. So in other words, this is the same as saying big A, big A, or big A, little a. Okay, and I'm just going to use A when we haven't given a letter. Okay, so uh, we can go here and look. And how do you know when, how can you look at a pedigree here? First of all, the males, the, the fathers, or the males are going to be squares. They may not be fathers yet, but the males are squares. The females are circles. If you're shaded in and they're shading in with green, that means you have the trait. You're, you have the uh, affected uh, situation, right? So uh, here in generation one, you have a male and you have a female. This is the next generation, the next one. So if we look here, then these would be the children on the third generation. These would be the parents and these would be grandparents up here, right? And so a uh, horizontal line would be the marriage or the cross that's occurring there. So nowadays, it's not necessarily married, right? But uh, they're the ones that are having children. Uh, and remember, each parent gives one or the other copy, right? So we got to look here and say, if this is dominant, you should be able to see the trait in every generation. And we do see that because we see shaded squares in all three generations. So that's already how you say this is going to be dominant. So if it's dominant, we can already go back here and say, I know this one has to be, have at least each one of these. We can go back and look and see what their genotypes are. We know they have to have at least one copy. I don't know for sure what the second allele is or the other one is, but I know they have to be at least that. Furthermore, if it's dominant, remember, you can either be homozygous or heterozygous, if you don't have it, because this is a dominant trait, then that means we already know what these are. These guys are going to be homozygous recessive. They are not carrying the trait. This much we figure out already because we see the trait in each generation, so it's dominant. If it's dominant, you're going to show it if you have one capital letter at least. Okay, uh, And so you know that. So now you might be able to use this information to go back further and figure out, well, what must this parent have? Okay. Now, to do that, we want to think about what you would get if the grandfather here in generation one was homozygous dominant. Okay. And we know the grandmother has to be little a, little a, because this is a dominant trait. She's not showing it. Okay. And the disease is in the dominant form. The recessive form, you don't have the disease. Well, let's take a look here. When we go and we fill this in, we're going to get all heterozygotes. This is like the true breeding cross with the peas. Every one of the offspring should have juvenile glaucoma. And so when we look here, this uh, uh, individual number one, the male, does not have it. So it cannot be this. There is no way the grandfather can be big A, big A. He must be big A, little a, using that logic. And if we see that if we do that cross here, where the grandfather was heterozygous instead, that gives us room for having a homozygous recessive, which is not having the disease in this case, right? So you see how you can use this pedigree analysis to go back and figure out genotypes. You can't always do it. Sometimes you can't figure it out, but sometimes you can. Okay. So right here. This offspring right here, we don't, you, it's almost like it's dominant. You can't tell what this is going to be until this person gets married and has their own kids, and then you go look at their kids. But is it possible here to go and figure out what his father is, which is uh, uh, generation two, number three? Can we actually figure that out? Uh, is, it, is it possible to get an affected one if this father is big A, big A? That certainly is possible because the mother here, generation two, number two, this mother here has to be little a, little a. Okay. So can you get that? Yes. If this father was big A, big A. But can you also get children? Is there a chance to get children that are also affected by it? If this father is big A, little a? And the answer is yes. Half of the children we would predict would have it. So this father can be either one. So you can't tell what the genotype is of this one. So this one is a question mark. We would put a question mark. We just don't know. 
There is not enough information. They would have to have more children. The only way we can be certain if he's heterozygote is if they had some that are not shaded in. In other words, some that didn't have juvenile glaucoma. So you have to use a little bit of logic here and your understanding of how genes are inherited. Oftentimes it's useful to write out a couple of pundit squares and see what are possibilities. And then we have recessive uh, pedigree. And in this case, this one is a, 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 a genetic disorder called albinism, and this is where you don't produce any melanin, your hair looks white, uh, your skin is very light complected, and it looks red because you can see the blood in the, uh, underneath the, in the lowest layer of the skin, so that comes out and looks pink. Uh, the iris of your eyes is going to look pink too because you just don't produce any of the pigments that give the browns or the blacks uh, tones to your skin. Uh, so it's a disease that affects the melanin production. Uh, and so a pedigree, it is recessive, and you can tell when you look at a pedigree, it looks like it's going to skip a generation. In other words, you can have a set of parents that do not have it, okay, but then have offspring. Like you see in generation two, you see there's a male there that inherits it. So when you see it skip a generation, what's meant by that is that you see on the pedigree that there are parents that do not have the trait, but then they have offspring that do. Remember when you shade it and they have the trait. And what trait are we talking about? Albinism, either albino or you're not. Okay, so what does that mean? It's recessive. Okay, that means that the individuals that have it, you can already go in there, and we're gonna use letter A's again, okay? That these individuals that are shaded in, because we've determined that this is recessive, those that have it are homozygous recessive, okay? If you don't have it, then you have to have one capital letter, okay? So now we want to go back and try to figure out well, what what the genotypes of the parents be, okay? Let's take a look at generation one. What are the genotypes of the male and the female there, the mom and the dad for that generation? We go back and we look at their offspring, they have to have one capital letter because we've determined this is a recessive trait, okay? You only get it if you're two little A's, two little letters, right? You're carrying both recessives. What we don't know is what the genotypes of the parents are. So now we take a look. These parents here have one that has it, okay? So let's say that the, the first parent is big A, big A, and the other parent is big A, big A. Is it possible to get two little A's? The answer is no. So neither parent, you cannot have both parents that are homozygous for both. What about one parent being heterozygote and the other one being homozygote dominant? Remember, they have to have at least one dominant letter so let's say that one is homozygous dominant, the other one is heterozygote. Can you get albinism? And here we have no albinism. And in the last one uh, column, we see that, again, this cannot be the case. Okay. So what must be the case? Remember, we have two uh, heterozygotes, like in the hybrid examples of the piece. Remember, it's always three to one. And he has a one quarter chance of getting recessive. Uh, trait being shown. Now, neither parent, I'm going to have space here, neither parent can uh, be homozygous recessive because then they would be shaded in, they would have albinism. So I think this is the only possibility left. And we see is it possible to get albinism here to have children that are? This Punnett square says that there is a one quarter chance of getting that, and you can see in this generation we see that we have uh, one of them. Actually, here's another kid over here that got married to someone else. There's a, a marriage here, but this is one of their children. So one, two, three, four, five. They had five children, and one of them showed it. Uh, this suggests that both parents are carriers, but they don't have the disease. When you're carrying a recessive trait, you're a carrier for it. You don't show it. So they're carriers of albinism, both parents. And we determine now that this parent must be heterozygote and this one must be heterozygote in this pedigree. So you can use that kind of logic and there's going to be some exercises in your lab where you go and you look at some pedigrees and you try to figure out what the genotypes are of different individuals on there. So I could ask you, uh, for example, 
what would the genotype for individual number three one? And that would be this individual right here. I might ask you, can you figure out what the genotype is for number three, four? And that would be this individual. Or what is the genotype for individual one, two? That would be asking for this individual here. So when I ask you in the pedigree, you look what generation and then what individual by number. Okay. Uh, there was another um, one I put, just put in recently uh, here, and this is another pedigree here. It doesn't have the Roman numerals or the numbers, the individuals, but you can see here that right now we see, okay, look, even if I didn't put the letters in there, okay, looks like one of the parents has it, and the next generation we don't see anything. And then here we have a set of parents that aren't carrying it, but then has an individual right there, right when I see that, and then they have offspring that has it, I know it's recessive, okay? I might not have caught it here, but I caught it right there. A set of parents, a generation of parents don't have it, and then they have a child that has it, that's recessive inheritance pattern. Okay, so that means that this one must be two little letters, this one must be two little letters, and I'm willing to bet based on the analysis we just did that the whole puzzle has to be heterozygous. They're using F there, so this would be big F, little F, big F, little F. Okay. So, um, this is the way the book has it. Uh, they show it, uh, showing the carriers. That's kind of cheating a little bit. They're already telling you that these are heterozygotes. Uh, you're going to get pedigrees where you don't have half shaded. I'm going to want you to figure out whether they're heterozygotes or not. So, um, your pedigrees uh, will look more like the ones that were on this page here. And then, so this is just showing some dominant recessive traits in humans. Look over it. Uh, don't spend too much time memorizing it. So uh, the recessive, here's some recessive traits uh, in the first two columns. Uh, albinism, we just talked about. Alcaptonuria, uh, red-green color blindness, cystic fibrosis, and what the phenotypes are. You lack pigmentation. Uh, you have an inability to distinguish red and green. Um, persistent fibrosis leads to a lot of problems. Usually individuals die once they get to their uh, age of 30, in their 30s, uh, because of problems with organ failures there. This has to do with uh, a gene that's for a protein on the surface of your cells that pumps uh, chloride ions out. Uh, then there's muscular dystrophy. This usually, uh, it's recessive. The muscles waste away and uh, individuals die before they get to adulthood. Hemophilia, where you can't stop bleeding, is also recessive, and sickle cell anemia uh, is a recessive uh, disorder that causes blood cells to misshapen. And then here are dominant ones. They're not necessarily genetic disorders themselves. A lot of the ones here are disorders. All of these are disorders. Having a mid-digital hair, that's going to be a hair that's uh, um, in the middle part of your finger um, there. Uh, that seems to have a dominant uh, inheritance pattern. It's not a disorder. Uh, having short fingers, uh, that's dominant trait. Huntington's disease, that one is uh, uh, quite tragic uh, as any genetic disorder that uh, is here. But this one is uh, causes the nervous system to degenerate by middle age, and then eventually you die from the disease. Uh, and then there's one for your ability to taste this compound, which is a very bitter flavor. Uh, whether you're uh, allergic or not to PTC. It's called phenylthiocarbamide. Um, some of us are born with receptors to taste it, some are not, uh, and it's a dominant trait. Uh, Camptodactyly, this is inability to straighten the little finger. Hypercholesterolemia, uh, this is a genetic uh, where you have higher genetic, uh, uh, genetically, you have higher cholesterol levels. And then polydactyly, where you're born with extra fingers or toes. You might have six toes or, or fingers. So now we're going to look at dihybrid crosses. And here, a new uh, rule that uh, inheritance patterns follow. Uh, was developed, and this one's called the principle of independent assortment. The prior one was the principle of segregation, where uh, every individual has two copies of alleles, and those alleles get separated when gametes are formed, and then the individual inherits one or the other. So they get the, the parental get, uh, alleles get segregated in uh, the next generation of offspring. 
here, if we're looking at two traits now, this is what we're looking at dihybrid crosses here, each of the uh, uh, traits or the alleles get separated independent of each other. So uh, again, we're going to go back to P's with Mendel's and your learning outcomes here are to evaluate a dihybrid cross. And that has a very specific meaning, just like monohybrid cross. So instead of looking at uh, a monohybrid and then crossing the monohybrid with another hybrid, that would be a monohybrid cross, we're going to be looking at two traits at the same time. Let's say trait uh, for character B, uh, and that should be a lowercase b there. And uh, here, in this case, they are heterozygotes for both. This is technically with the X in the middle, saying that we're crossing them. This is a dihybrid cross. Anything else where you don't have a uh, hybrid for both uh, characters is not considered a dihybrid cross. It would be referred to as just a two-trait cross. So keep that in mind. If a genetics problem tells you dihybrid cross, that means you're a heterozygote for both, in both individuals as you're crossing. That is an important thing. Okay, so um, we got to keep that in mind. So um, the other, uh, second learning outcome is that uh, looking at explaining Mendel's principle of independent assortment, uh, which means the alleles for uh, each of the characters are going to assort independent of each other into and given into uh, uh, gametes to go into the next uh, into offspring, and then compare segregation of alleles for different genes with the behavior of different homologs in meiosis. So we can go back to meiosis again. Remember that Mendel did not know about meiosis. He made observations of phenotypes uh, and then came up with model using uh, mathematics uh, to figure all this out. Meiosis, though, actually explains his model, provides the mechanism, which makes it even a more powerful model. Uh, so let's take the case here where, uh, just as before, we're going to now look at two traits. Here we're going to look at the color of the seed for a pea, and we're going to look at the shape of the pea. So we got over here we have round and yellow, two traits. And here we have wrinkled and green. Okay. Now let's say that we start this experiment and we don't know which one is dominant. You just make sure that you have uh, strains of peas where you have true breeding peas that always produce yellow round seeds and every generation that's what you get and the same thing for wrinkled and green and then you go and get individual plants true breeding plants and you cross them okay so this would be uh, initially it's going to be a, a two trait cross it's not a dihybrid cross and when you're done and you look at the next generation. So we cross these two and they produce pods with seeds in there. Okay. And this is what you get. Okay. The F1 generation, all the seeds are round and yellow. So what does this tell us? This gives us a way of defining which of the dominant traits are. So for color, we're going to dominate. We're going to define capital Y uh, as yellow and capital because it's the dominant. We're going to use the same letter but lowercase for the recessive trait. So this would stand for green. Okay. And then we're going to use for uh, wrinkled and round. Round seems to be the uh, dominant one. So we're going to do capital R for round. And wrinkle starts with a W, but we're going to use a lowercase r for the recessive trait. So big R is for round, dominant trait. And the little r is going to be for the wrinkled. Okay. If we're using this uh, definitions now based on the F1 results, we can go back and assign uh, genotypes here. If this was true breeding yellow round, then that means it would have both copies because it was producing yellow. Uh, alleles would be both dominant. And the same thing for the shape round. And then over here, we would have... Uh, the, we would have homozygous recessive for both traits, for the wrinkled and the green. So we're going to have a lowercase for green and uh, for the wrinkled lowercase r's as we define them here. So remember, you have to have two copies 
of these uh, inheritance factors we now call genes uh, on there. And what does that mean? Uh, well, remember the first principle is that we have to segregate uh, into the next generation. So that means the uh, uh, the parents, the parental generation, only give one copy of each. But this one, they only have one kind of copy to give. It's only capital Y and capital R. Uh, so that means that this parent is going to contribute one big Y and one big R because it, that's all it has to give. So they're going to be separate. We're going to separate each one into the next generation. That means the next generation is going to get big Y, big R. The same thing for this parent, and it only has uh, little Ys and little Rs to give the recessive uh, allele. So this is going to be what your hybrid looks like. Okay, that's its genotype. Okay, so this is your dihybrid. hybrid. Okay, it's because it's hybrid for both traits. Okay, so now let's say we take the F1 and we cross those together. So we get several with these, and that fits what a dihybrid cross is. I used letter A and B here to generalize. This is a dihybrid, and if we get two of these and we cross two plants that came from this seed, uh, then this is what Mendel got. Mendel got back uh, different uh, uh, phenotypes here. And not only that, he got back some that were like the original parentals. He got some yellow round like the original parental. He got some green wrinkled that were like the original parental, but then he got these guys right here, those two in the middle. Okay. Those two in the middle show a recombination of the original parental generation. In the parents, there was no such thing as round and green, but you got round and green. It's almost like we kind of mixed what the parents had to start with. Uh, and then the same thing, there was no such thing as a yellow wrinkled in the parental generation here, but you got those. We're gonna call these genetic recombinants. Okay, and there's a very important ratio here. This fits the definition of a dihybrid cross because we're gonna take uh, individuals that are grown from this seeds that would have this genotype, that's the assumption based on the original crossing from the parental, and you're going to cross with another one just like it. That would be a dihybrid cross. Anytime you get a dihybrid cross, you're going to get a ratio phenotypic, not genotypic. Genotypic would be crazy to try to account for. So here we're only going to ask you for phenotypic ratios. You're going to get 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. So you're going to want to remember that. A dihybrid cross always gives you a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. The 9 is going to represent the dominant original parental for both traits, and the one here at the end is going to represent uh, the recessive original parental traits, and the two threes in the middle are going to represent the recombinants. That's something to remember. You can answer a lot of questions very quickly when it's a dihybrid cross. If it's a two-trait cross, you're going to have to work out a larger Punnett square to get this done. We'll show you that Punnett square in a bit. Okay, so remember nine to three to three to one, just like with a monohybrid cross, it's a three to one. Right, dominant to recessive. Uh, and then you got to remember here that the middle three are the recombinants. Okay, so keep that in mind. Uh, so let's take the case of a, a dihybrid cross. For a dihybrid cross, we have to figure out how exactly are the alleles from both trait, from both characters, the color and the shape, going to segregate. They have to segregate independently. So the way I do this is saying that each individual can inherit either a big Y or a little Y. Each individual can inherit from that one parent, either a big R or a little R, the dominant or the recessive, right? And so we got to figure out well, what are the possible combinations because when the gametes are formed, remember, we now know that the alleles, the genes, are actually on two uh, copies of the chromosome. Remember, we get a pair of chromosomes, one from each parent. Uh, so th these genes came from the parent generation before, or the generation before that. And when it comes time for this individual to make its gamete sperm or egg, those are going to be separated because of meiosis, right? And we know that now. We didn't know that back then. But what are the possibilities? If the assortment, separation, and then assorting is independent, like we said, then each allele has equal chance of getting paired with one of the other alleles. So that means this is a possibility. So one of the possibilities to produce a gamete, sperm or egg, 
that has both dominant alleles. Uh, and it's going to kind of look like, you remember that when we were multiplying, uh, uh, doing the FOIL method uh, in algebra, the first, outer, inner, last, this will get us what we need. So our first one's first letter of the Y, first letter for the R, the outer. That gives me the outer two, the big Y and the little R. That's going to give me big Y, little R. That's what one gamete would, another gam possible gamete would look like, equal chance for that. Then we go to the inner ones, little y, big R. And then we go to the last, okay, uh, little y, little R. So those are the four possible gametes that can be produced if, because you know, first of all, we have to separate uh, the y's and the r's. Right, that's law of segregation. And if you notice, if you ignore the R's, you get two kinds. You get big, you get uh, gametes with big Y's and gametes uh, uh, with little Y's. Okay, the same thing is true for the R's. You get gametes with uh, big R's, and then you get gametes with little R's. There's only two kinds that you can get. But when you combine the two together, you get four possibilities now. Uh, when you're considering both together. So this tells me then that I'm going to need a Punnett square, not two by two, but a four by four, because we're doing a dihybrid cross, and both can produce these possible gametes. Okay. And I'm going to recommend, like I did before, always put the big letter in front when you're figuring out this Punnett square. Okay. And it's got to be a four by four, because each parent produces... four possible gametes. Now, they're going to produce thousands of these gametes, but roughly one-fourth of them are going to be one or the other or the other because there's equal chance of any one of these forming. So you're going to put them on top uh, here because we're considering two uh, alleles at the same time. Okay, And that's the first parent that we're crossing. We're doing a dihybrid cross. Uh, and then uh, the next one is little y, big R. And then little y, little r. And then we're going to have the same arrangement because the other parent would produce similar gametes. And then you just go in there and you figure out filling in the Punnett square. And again, I always recommend that you put in the larger letters first, okay? Because uh, it's going to help us identify similar ones here. So this would be uh, when we combine, if this sperm fertilizes this egg, then you would get an offspring that has this genotype, okay? And then you continue. Uh, another equal chance of this one fertilizing this one, and then so on. So these represent equal chances of any possible combination uh, in there. And then we're going to go through there, and we're going to look. We're not going to look at the ratio for genotypes because it's too many to keep track of. There are 16 here, but we can find the, the phenotypes. So we're going to ignore the genotypes, but we're going to try to count up and see if we get that 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 here. All things being equal, this is what the Punnett square helps us work out what we can expect. Uh, in uh, If we started counting up the C's, we would find a total of, uh, there are 16 squares in there, nine of them are gonna, should be yellow, uh, showing that dominant, dominant. Uh, three should be, uh, three out of the 16 should be some recombinant, one or the other, and then one out of the, of the 16 should be a recessive for both traits. So let's go through. I'm gonna go ahead and work this out here. It's going to fill in, and I'm always going to put in the capital letter first. So... We can go now and try to identify uh, the different kinds of phenotypes. And we'll just always start in the first box uh, right here. And in this one here, that one is going to be yellow because you have at least one capital Y, dominant yellow, and round. So that has to be yellow and round. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through here and I'm going to circle all the ones I see that should be yellow and round. This has got to be yellow. That's also round because you have at least one capital R. So that's two. Yellow and round. Three. That's yellow and round. It's uh, heterozygote for both, but it is yellow and round because the dominant traits are there. Uh, dominant alleles. Yellow and round. That's five. This one, no. 
The second one on the second row is not. This one is. That's yellow and round. The last one here is not. It's going to the third row. Yellow and round. Yellow and round. No, no. Yellow and round. No, no, no. So how many is that? Did I circle? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So far, that matches uh, the ratio I told you ahead of time. This is predicted if the alleles are separated at random from the parents, and then if fertilization is random, this is what we would expect. So what is the Punnett square? It allows us to predict what we would expect uh, in the next generation. Uh, so now what's the next? Let's go to the next open square and try to count that one. This one is going to give us yellow and wrinkled. So I'm going to write that down. Yellow and then wrinkled. And so that's yellow wrinkle one, yellow wrinkle two, no, no. This second one at the bottom is yellow wrinkled. That's three and then no and no. So there's three out of those 16 is yellow wrinkled. So three sixteenths. We would expect three out of every 16 to be that it's never perfect, like flipping a coin, but this is a prediction, right? It's a hype, it's what we can use to test uh, to see if we get that when you actually run the experiment. So looking at the next open square, uh, it shows me it's going to be green and round. Okay, so green and round. That's green and round. This one is green and round. And the last one is not green and round, so it's green and round, and that fits, uh, actually that fits the, the second one that I put there, uh, green and round, and that's three. And then the last one, the only one available there is yellow, I mean uh, green, and wrinkled, like the original parental. So we do get that with the Punnett square, and generally anytime you have a two trait cross, you would use a four by four Punnett square to do this. Uh, so what can explain this? The only way this can explain this is the only mathematical model that can explain this is, and remember, Mandel didn't know that there was chromosomes, didn't know about genes, but he knows that the offspring are inheriting one copy of a heritable factor, he didn't call them genes back then, one copy of each for each character, right? And uh, the copy you get, the allele you get will determine the traits you express, right? So you can either inherit for color a yellow or a green, okay? And it's an equal 50-50 chance of getting that. The same thing for the shape. Equal chance of either getting uh, from the other parent, okay? Uh, and uh, so overall, uh, you start to work it out. And uh, given that's the case, that the, for the color, the alleles are going to segregate, segregate from each other to go into the offspring because you only get one copy of the other. And the same thing for uh, not just the color, but for the shape. And you're either going to get a wrinkle or a round, and they get segregated and go into there. And the way the yellow and the, the, uh, the color and the shape are going to be put into the next offspring is independent of each other. So what happens with the color and the shape, they don't influence each other. That's the only possible model. Uh, that explains the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 uh, ratio. So this is amazing because, again, we didn't know about uh, the physical gene itself and the DNA didn't know about chromosomes or meiosis. So this is essentially uh, what we just did earlier. It's the pictures from your lab man, and they're just showing chromosomes. Again, Mendel didn't know these, but let's just say that the genes are located, uh, they're on the chromosomes, and they have uh, two separate uh, pairs of chromosomes, and this is one pair of chromosomes, and this is the other pair uh, here, uh, and then the same thing for here and here. And so the uh, deuterium meiosis, uh, a pure breeding, uh, true breeding can only produce one kind of gamete, um, which would be big R, uh, big Y, big R, and over here you would get just little Y, little R. Uh, and then when we cross these, your only thing you possible possibility you can get is, uh, or what you what we see is the dominant yellow and round only, but they're hybrids now. So they're, um, I think they're putting the shape of the piece first. That's fine. They're putting the the, the color second. 
Uh, so big R, little R, big Y, little Y is the same as saying big Y, little Y, big R, little R. Uh, and then from here, the possible gametes, there's four possible gametes that you can produce as you separate the alleles into gametes by meiosis. Uh, so it seems that the, the behavior of the chromosomes during meiosis are explaining why uh, the alleles get separated independent of each other. Uh, and so when you do that, and you cell fertilize, this is taking the F1 and fertilizing with another F1. They're dihybrids. This is your dihybrid cross. Here's the Punnett square. Uh, and you get your 9 out of 16, 3 out of 16, 3 out of 16, and 1 out of 16. There are 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. And remember that the middle two are the recombinations. They're genetic recombinants. Because they do not represent, they do not, sh they, they do not show the same traits as the original parentals. Remember, there was only round and yellow, and it was uh, wrinkled and green. Yet we're getting uh, another combination of those two traits. Okay, so you get nine to three to three to one, and this would be a very simplified way of saying what the genotypes are. Here, uh, you can get. Um, Round if you have a capital R or a little r or a dominant or recessive for the second one, so it doesn't matter there. Uh, it's either big R, little r, same thing here, and the end result is you get round and yellow. Here you get round and green, okay, and it could be a big R or a little r. You're still going to get round. Uh, this uh, here, the the only optional one there is for the yellow. Uh, in order to get um, the recessive uh, wrinkle, it has to be homozygous recessive there. But for the color, you can get yellow being homozygous dominant or heterozygous. And then here, this is the only possibility here. And the ratio would still be 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. But you can see uh, how many possibilities are for that. It could be big R, little r for the first spot. It could be big R, big R, right? So these are the, and then you got to take into account, well, what is this here? could be big Y, big Y, or big Y, uh, little Y. And overall, now you're talking about writing um, uh, eight different genotypes, uh, nine different genotypes, uh, uh, eight different genotypes, actually, uh, in this process. Or So in other words, to try to go and figure out how many different uh, genotypes you get uh, overall. So... Uh, I think four, it's four, probably four different genotypes, but in various, uh, whether one parent or the other one gives them. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm not going to ask you on a two-trick cross to give me the genotypic ratio, but I, uh, but I will ask you to give me the phenotypic ratio. It's nine to three to three to one. Uh, now, how is this observation explained? The new rule comes up. First, we're going to segregate. You're carrying two copies as an individual of, of your alleles, and you're going to separate them. That's the principle or law of segregation. You segregate. Now, if you're talking about more than one pair, because you're looking at two characters, uh, two traits, then each one of those pairs is going to segregate independent of each other, and that can be explained by the behavior of chromosomes. Here, they're only showing two pairs. Uh, for a dihybrid cross, and this is a hybrid here, and this is, uh, remember the germline cells that go through meiosis, so let's say R is on the first pair of chromosomes for the shape of the P, and the color is on the second pair, and this individual is heterozygote for both because it's got capital and lowercase, capital and lowercase, and remember that each pair of chromosomes lines up on the metaphase plate independent of each other, so this is one possibility, here is another possibility, okay? Keep it in mind that uh, the capital R is there, the lowercase r is on the red one, okay? And then uh, over here, the lowercase is on the red, and then over here, um, the dominant allele is on the blue. Okay, so you have two possibilities. Remember, we're going to separate these, okay? They're going to be separated during anaphase, and when they do, when we do, we're going to get gametes that are big R, big Y, and you're going to get gametes that are little r, little y, okay? That's these gametes and these. They're showing a total here of uh, eight altogether, but really, uh, these two are really one kind, so uh, two out of eight is one out of four, 
okay so same uh, it's the same ratio then over here if the chromosomes lined up this alternative way this other possibility then you would get big r little y and then over here uh, you would get a little r big y and uh, those are two other kinds of gametes that we would see here and here and again two out of eight is the same as one out of four uh, so the law or the principle or law of independent assortment, sometimes it's written as law, the law of independent assortment is talking about the, the way the alleles for one trait are uh, going to be inherited by the offspring. In other words, be uh, separated into the gametes are independent of what happens with the other pair. Okay, why? Because they're, if they're on separate chromosomes, the, separate, the pairs of chromosomes lined up independent of each other. Okay, so one pair doesn't influence the way the other one goes. Uh, and so this is why we ended up setting up the Punnett square as a 4x4, four four because uh, when it's a dihybrid, you're going to get four possible gametes. Uh, the same thing with the other individual that's hybrid. Okay, so again, Mendel didn't know about chromosomes, but his model was looking at something that he called heritable factors which we now call genes. And we know that they have physical locations within a strand of DNA on a physical location within a chromosome, okay? So the behavior of chromosomes, when they line up independent of each other, they're carrying those alleles on there. They're carrying those segments of that gene. Because those homologs, the homologous pairs, uh, during metaphase one, lined up independent of each other, and those chromosomes get uh, segregated independent of each other. The alleles on there get segregated too. So the mechanism is there that makes this an even more solid uh, principle. 